In the book of Acts chapter 16, we have recorded a very interesting story in the life of the Apostle Paul. Together with Silas, he had entered the city of Philippi and began to preach and ran into opposition from Satan who, in possession of a young girl, followed behind him, calling out, We know who you are. These are the men, the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. This carried on for many days, the verse says, verse 18. And Paul was grieved and turned and rebuked the evil spirit and said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he came out the same hour. But when the masters of the girl who had been using this soothsayer for their financial gain realized that they no longer could use her in that way, they stirred up trouble and caused a, a riot in the town. And as a result, Paul and Silas were taken, beaten and put in prison. But at midnight, we are told that they were singing praises and praying to God. And then there came an earthquake, which not only undid the fastenings of the ankle bands and the chains that bound them, but also flew open the prison door. The jailer who was in charge of the prison woke up from his sleep and when he saw the prison door open, he thought surely the prisoners have all escaped and under Roman law he knew that uh, that would be for him a death sentence. He took out his sword and thought, well, I won't be humiliated by being executed by the Romans, I'll execute myself. But Paul saw what he was about to do and called out to him, don't do it. We are all here. When he was assured of that, it says that he got a light and sprang into the prison and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out. Now he must have heard about the reason why they were in prison and their preaching about salvation because he asked a very interesting question which will form the basis of our study this afternoon. He said, what must I do to be saved? What did Paul answer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. So he took them out the same hour, washed their wounds, baptized in the name of the Lord straightway, and then set a meal before them. <clears throat> Interesting story, but this story raises the most important question that anybody can ask. And that question is, what must I do to be saved? And many people ask interesting questions in life. As a college teacher, I have seen the students come to college, not sure what course they should do. So they enroll in one course, and a few weeks or months later, they switch to another course. So asking the question, what work must I do in my life, is a very important question. And of course, the young people often ask themselves the question, who would I one day marry? And I tell you, that is also a very important question. But this question asked by the jailer in Philippi is the most important of all questions that you can imagine. What must I do to be saved? The scriptures tell us that God has provided salvation for all men. John 3:16. That whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. And the invitation of Revelation 22, verse 17, which says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, let him that is a thirst come, let him take the water of life freely. The invitation is there for all. God has provided salvation for all. The scriptures tell us that God is patient, long suffering not willing that any should perish. 
because he has provided salvation for all. But our question is, how can we avail ourselves of it? The devil has introduced some ways whereby he has tried to distort the process of salvation by false methods to be tried. We have, first of all, asceticism, which uh, indicates that uh, since our human natures are sinful, we must punish ourselves and try to achieve salvation by afflicting our bodies, whipping ourselves, depriving ourselves of sometimes the necessities of life, living in a monastery, shunning away from the world. That doesn't work. That's a false method. Another method that people have tried is that to try and earn salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 9, we read that salvation is not earned by works. It says in verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And verse 9 makes it very clear, Not of works, lest any man should boast. And I've often thought about that verse. I thought, if our works could earn us salvation, or even if they're only partly contributing to our salvation, it wouldn't be a fair process. Because some men can do more work than others. So some men would achieve salvation where others may miss out not able to do the works that some could do. For example, a person with great talent could use those talents in God's service and therefore earn credit, merit points, if you like, and get salvation that way. Whereas a man who has few talents would be disadvantaged. What about the man who had great wealth? He could endow hospitals and schools and all kinds of charities and earn credit with God that way compared with a man who was poor and not able to contribute. We think also of those who have a long life, many years in which they can work for God compared with a youth who is cut down by accident or illness in his early years. So if our works contributed to salvation, it would be unfair God knows that. That's why he has said, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I don't want you to think for a moment that I'm against good works. Because some people who read these verses, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, don't go on to read verse 10. And verse 10 says, we were created for good works. God wants us to do good works. But the good works that we do is the fruitage of salvation, not the means of getting it. We do good works because God has saved us by grace as a free gift. You see, gifts and wages are incompatible. You cannot earn a gift. If you earn something, it's wages. Wages of sin is death, but God gives eternal life as a gift to us. Another method that some people have tried is pilgrimages. Some have thought that uh, if they could go to Palestine and visit the places where Jesus lived and worked and where he traveled, that that could earn them some credit with God. For many years, five and a half years, I was a missionary in India. And one day, as I was principal of a boarding school, a student came into my office and said, Sir, there's a man outside on the road out here. Uh, you ought to come and see him. He has come all the way from Calcutta. Now, Calcutta was about 1,200 miles away from where the school is located, where I worked. So I went out and I met this man. He had come all the way from Calcutta with a box on wheels and a harness around his shoulders in which he would pull that box along the street and lie down on the road with a stick in his hand and reach out and make a line on the road just in front of his body and get up and 
walk to that spot where the stick had reached, lie down again and make a reach out with his hands and make another mark, get up and go to that mark. And he had come 1,200 miles doing that to earn credit in a pilgrimage to a holy place of Herdwar. He had been there and was now on his way back home to Calcutta, another 1,200 miles returning, trying to earn salvation by this pilgrimage that he was earning. Another method that they use is knowledge. In Hindu writings, they state a point of their teaching and then they say, to know this is salvation. Well, salvation for them is not salvation as we think it. For them, salvation is what to reach a state, reach a state of nirvana, <coughs> where you cease to have independent existence and you are absorbed into the great spirit of God and you no longer have independent existence. That's their concept of salvation. And you have certain knowledge. It reminds me of early Christians some of which developed what we call Gnostic ideas. And Gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge, and from it comes the word Gnostic. So you had secret knowledge, then you would be benefited by it. And there were certain early Christian sects who used this method to try and influence people in their teaching. All these efforts do not achieve salvation. The Bible says in, Jer in Jeremiah 13 and verse 30, 23, the Ethiopian cannot change his skin nor the leopard his spots. Therefore, those of us who have carnal natures, which we all have, cannot earn salvation that way. Our righteousness, we are told in Isaiah 64 verse 6, is as filthy rags. Why then do some people gather around these filthy rag garments and pride themselves in what? good things they can do, thinking that that will earn them salvation. Acts chapter 16 tells us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Well, there was a student who came to Avondale College when I was a lecturer there, a non-Adventist young man, probably not a, even a Christian and the students began to witness to him about the way of salvation. When they talked to him about righteousness by faith and believing in Jesus and so on, this young man shook his head and he said, no, I can't accept that. He said, that is too easy. He thought that the way of salvation was something he had to do to earn credit with God. And of course, the he had difficulty grasping the concept. How then can a person be saved? When I was a student in the seminary in the United States, we had a visiting pastor by the name of Pastor Carlisle B. Haynes come and give a series of lectures to us. He entitled the series Lectures to Young Ministers. He was an old man, probably about what age I am now. And he was lecturing to seminary students. Some of them were ordained pastors who were upgrading, but many of us were just in our early 20s. And he gave a lecture one day that I will never forget. He said he went to run an evangelistic campaign in a city in the United States. He put out his advertising, and his name was on the material that he put out, advertising a program, and one day he got a telephone call. And when he answered the phone, the voice at the other end said, you do not know me, but are you Pastor Haynes? And he said, yes, I am. He said, well, you don't know me, but I am the man in charge of the local prison in this city. And I have a young man in incarceration here who is sentenced to death for murder and he has seen some of your advertising and he would like to talk to you. Could you please come and meet with him? Well, there was an opportunity to go and to witness to the young man about Jesus. And when he met the young man, this is the question that he asked. 
How can I be saved? After all, he had a terrible sin record. It was on his mind. He was facing the death sentence. How can I be saved? And I will never forget the answer that Pastor Haynes, the next words that came out of his mouth. He said, I did not know what to tell him. Now you might think that's a, an apocryphal story, not true. If you go up to Avondale College, you ask the librarian to check Carlisle B. Haynes' name in their files and to get out the book, Lectures to Young Ministers, because those lectures were later printed up as a book and there's a copy in the Avondale Library. I've seen it there, I've read the story there, as well as having heard it in person when he gave the lectures. And it is a true story. He said, I was embarrassed. I did not know what to say. He said, I was embarrassed then, I was embarrassed now. Well, I'm quite sure that Carlisle B. Haynes found the way to give the correct answer to that question because he went on to become one of the leading evangelists for the Adventist Church in North America and baptized many, many people as a result of his work. Notice the answer that uh, Paul gave to the Philippian jailer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. What does it involve to believe? We must believe that Jesus is God in human form. That is the incarnation. As the Bible tells us, he was God manifest in the flesh. We must believe in his sinless life. We must believe in his vicarious death. That is, that he died a death instead of us. Believe in his resurrection and his ascension to heaven. Believe in his priestly ministration in the sanctuary in heaven that we read about in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Believe that he has the power to forgive sins. Believe that he is able to give us the more abundant life here and now. And believe in his soon return to gather his people. Believe that he will make an end of sin and sinners and restore the earth to its Edenic beauty as the home for God's people for eternity. In Romans 6 verse 23 we read that the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Again notice that it's a gift. This means we are all under a death sentence because the Bible tells us all have sinned. But if we accept Christ, the Bible tells us also in John 5, 24, that we pass from death unto life. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be under a death sentence? In my years of work in India, there was an American missionary that became a good friend of mine. His name is Pastor Charles Holford. When he was working in North America before he came to India, he was doing some prison ministry work and met a young man by the name of Elmore in prison who had been sentenced for murder. He had gone into his fast food outlet shop and uh, demanded the girl behind the counter empty the till and give him the cash. He thought that she didn't know who he was, but she knew who he was. And she looked at him and she said, Elmore, why are you doing this? And when he knew that she knew his name, he panicked. And he took out a weapon and he murdered her so that she could not speak his name to the police. But the police tracked him down. They found him, they arrested him. He was tried, found guilty and sentenced to death. And now he was in prison. <clears throat> Pastor Holford met him. And he asked this question, I guess, too. What must I do to be saved? How can I be forgiven? Pastor Holford studied with him. And as a result of those studies in prison, he became a converted man. But because he was converted, did not cancel the death sentence. So one day when he was being visited by Pastor Holford, he said to Pastor Holford, the day for my execution has been set. 
I am to be executed in the electric chair on such and such a date. And then he asked Pastor Holford for, with a question that Pastor Holford didn't want to hear. Pastor, would you come and be with me when I die? Pastor Holford didn't think that was a very nice question to ask because he didn't want to go and witness his execution. But then he thought, well, if I can help him to be true to Jesus to the end, maybe I should be there. So on the day of the execution, he went down early to meet with him in the prison. What do you think they were studying? They were studying about the resurrection that would take place when Jesus comes and the dead in Christ will raise first, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and on. Wonderful theme for a man who's going to be executed in the next few minutes. And while they were studying together, the door opened and in came one of the guards. He said, sorry to interrupt you, but I've got a duty to perform. And he took out a sharp knife and slit the coat sleeves up to the elbows and the same with the trousers up to the knees. You see, to die in the electric chair, the electric chair is just an ordinary chair that you can sit in but you're strapped to it so you can't get up. And they put the bands around your ankles and bands around your wrist and bands around your head. But before they put the bands around the head, they cut off all the hair because hair is an insulation material and they want the current to do its work. So they then cut off all of his hair and then he left. In came a, another guard. He said, I've got your last meal gave a tray of food to the prisoner, his last meal. And he passed that we have a tray for you too and gave him a, a tray of food. Pastor Holford told me, Elmore ate all of his food, cleaned the plate. But he said, I, I couldn't eat. I picked at the food, I tried to eat something, but he said, I was so tense I couldn't eat. So they came in, took the praise plates away, and they continued the study on the resurrection and the coming of Jesus and the home of the redeemed, encouraging him. And then a man came and said, time is up, follow me. And took the two of them down into the execution room. There they fitted him up with the band around the head and the ankles and the wrists and so on. And then the one in charge of the proceedings said, Delmore, is there anything you want to say before you die? He said, yes. I want to thank Pastor Holford for coming and telling me about Jesus and how he will redeem me and save me and give me eternal life one day. Thank you. And then the signal was given The executioner took a great big handle and brought it down and plugged it in. The current did its deadly work and Elmore was gone. Terrible thing to be under a death sentence, but all of us have been under this death sentence. Many people don't realize it because the wages of sin, the Bible says death, and the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory or the character of God. But Jesus took that fall for us and gave us instead a gift and the hope of eternal life. What we have to do is to be willing to accept the gift. Some people find it hard to accept gifts. We are taught from our childhood, if you want something, get a job and work for it. I remember my son Ewan came to me one day and said, Dad, I want to build a yacht. I said, build a yacht? He was only in high school. I said, you, you couldn't build a yacht. You wouldn't know how to. Well, he said, all the boys in my class are going to build one. Barry Plain is a teacher and he's going to tell us all and show us all how to build one. Well, I knew Barry Plain could build a yacht. But then I said to him, well, how much is it going to cost you? He said, oh, about $100. I 
for the materials. I said, son, you're living with a family on only one income. So I don't have $100 to give you. And I could see on his face, his face went down, his crest fallen. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you $50, but you earn the rest. Within about 24 hours or 48 hours at the most, he had a job. Went down to the factory. Got a job down there, a part-time job. And he earned the money, got his wages for it. I gave him the $50 that I could spare. And he built the yacht and took us out on Lake Macquarie. And we had a great time sailing around. Even took my wife out with him on Lake Macquarie. And boy, that yacht that he built, I call it the Nat. But the, he sewed the sail up on the, my wife's sewing machine. He made it all. And that would aquaplane if you got the wind in the right sail. And we had a lot of fun with it. But you see, we're taught if you want something, work for it. What does the government tell us? Don't get on welfare. Get a job. Work for it. And we are taught from our youth to work for it. At least most of us are. So taught. But when it comes to salvation, we have to change gears, change our thinking, because we can't work for it. It's God's gift. All we have to do is to accept the gift. That's why the student at Avondale College said it's too easy. He wanted to do something that was difficult. God's gift cannot be counterfeited. One day, a teacher had a class of small boys in school. He had bought himself a new watch. I had a watch on my wrist when I was in Mongolia a few years ago. <laughs> my watch packed up. Well, when you're traveling international, you need to have a watch to know what the time is, to make your connections with flights and travel and all that. So I went to a shop and I bought two watches. They only cost about $5 each. And I got one of them. Well, this teacher thought he'd buy himself a new watch. So he got a new watch, but the old one was still going. And he thought I would use this watch as a teaching aid for my boys. So one day he lined all the boys up in the class. Johnny, the big boy, in one end, and Timmy, the little boy, down on the end. And he took off his watch and he went to Johnny and said, Johnny, you see this watch? He said, yes, sir. He said, do you, do you like it? He said, yeah, it's very nice. He said, here, huh? you can have it. And Johnny thought, hmm, there's some trick here. He's not going to give me his watch. And he thought, oh, if I put my hand out to take it, <laughs> he'll only pull it away and say, ha, ha, you thought you were going to get it, didn't you? And all the boys will laugh at me and mock me about it. So he thought, I'll play it smart. He said, no, thank you, sir. Who is the next boy? He said, you like my watch? And he thought, oh, Johnny's a smart boy. He's the biggest boy in the class, and he's very clever, and he must be a good reason why he said no. So he played it safe, and he said no. And the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, each one's taken the lead from the bigger boys right down to the end. Until he came down to Timmy, he said, Timmy, would you like my watch? He said, yes, sir. He said, here, you can have it. He put it in his hand and took it. And all the boys said, oh, sir, we didn't know you meant it. <laughs> a bit like that sometimes with salvation. We don't think God really means it when he said salvation is a gift. We have put out our hand and take God's gift and thank him for it. You can't earn it. You can't earn a gift. And the Bible tells us salvation is a gift more than once. non <clears throat> Believers some find this difficult at times to grasp that God would give us such a wonderful gift as eternal life. I read in Isaiah 35 and verse 8 that the way of salvation is so simple that even a fool, which in the text there means an uneducated person, not a stupid person, need not err therein. The way of salvation is so simple that an uneducated person can follow it. If he's willing to believe it, to accept the provision that God has made. 
The acceptance of God's gift also involves what we call conversion. We must first of all recognize our need of conversion. Confession of sin is required. In Daniel 9, we read that Daniel prayed, confessing sins, sins of his own and sins of his people. In Numbers 5 and verse 7, we read that they who confess their sins, then they that confess their sins, which they have done, will receive forgiveness. And Leviticus 5, 5 says, confession of sins must be specific. If we know we have stolen something, then we must say to God, I have stolen it, please forgive me for stealing. If we have told lies, or whatever it may be, dishonored our parents, whatever the sin may be, be specific and name the sin as you confess it. It's quite all right to say as well, Lord, what I don't remember, please forgive all my sins, ones I don't remember, as well as the ones I do remember that I've confessed. That's what's required according to Leviticus 5 verse 5. And 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When I think of that verse, I think of a story that my father told when he was principal of a school in Tonga. That's where I was born. A little girl came to his office one day and said, Sir, I have done something wrong. I don't know what it was that she did wrong because my father never told me. But she felt bad about it. She felt that she wanted to get this guilt complex removed. And she didn't know how to go about it. So she came for help. My father said to her, well, the first thing we must do is to acknowledge that you've done wrong and you've done that, but now we must ask God to forgive you because if you confess your sin, God will forgive you. Let us kneel down and pray and you ask God to forgive your sin and he will. She said, I don't know how to pray. She's only a small girl. I don't know how to pray. My father said, all right, Let's kneel down together and I will say a prayer and you repeat the prayer after me and that way you will make it your prayer. And she agreed. So they knelt down together. My father said, Lord, we come here to confess a sin. Lord, we come here to confess a sin. I have done so and so. I have done so and so. God, I'm sorry for what I've done. God, I'm sorry for what I've done. Please forgive me for what I've done. Please forgive me for what I've gone. Now, God, we want to say thank you for your forgiveness. Nothing. Now, God, we want to say thank you for your forgiveness. Nothing. My father said, what's the matter? I don't know if he's forgiven me. My father said, well, you confessed your sin, didn't you? Yes. You told God you were sorry? Yes. You really mean it when you said you were sorry? Yes, I meant it. Well, then God has forgiven you already because he promises if you confess your sin, he'll forgive. So God's forgiven you already, hasn't he? I don't know. I hope he has. We might smile at this little girl's struggle to accept God's forgiveness just like that. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever asked God to forgive the same sin more than once? done something wrong during the day, lost your temper or something, kneel down beside your bed at night before you go to bed and say, Lord, I did wrong today, please forgive me. You get into bed and put your head on the pillow and you still feel a bit bad and you say, Lord, please forgive me for that. Next morning you say, Lord, please forgive me, I lost my temper yesterday. And we ask God to forgive us for the same sin several times. What are we telling God? We're virtually saying to God, I don't really believe you forgave me the first time I confessed it. Now, I don't think God blames us because the Bible says God is greater than our hearts. He knows our hearts. He knows how we feel. He knows our remorse and our guilt feelings. And he wants to take them away. And so we want to thank God for his forgiveness. I think that's something that we Christians ought to do more 
Thank God for his forgiveness. What a wonderful provision it is to be forgiven. How wonderful is it? Well, <clears throat> quote from Steps to Christ. Ellen White wrote these beautiful words. Let's read them. If you give yourself to him, to Jesus, and accept him as your saviour, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are counted righteous. And then what's the rest of it say? Christ's character stands in the place of your character and you are accepted before God just as if you had never sinned. That's good news. That's the gospel. That's the best news you and I could ever hear. That God can look at you and look at me when we've confessed our sins as if we were never a sinner by actions. And that's not just the teaching of Ellen White or the teachings of the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament too. Years ago, I was with a group of students up at Tenterfield in North New South Wales on a Peel for Missions trip. And I was on the program reading the Bible through that year. And uh, that Sabbath morning, I, <clears throat> I got up and I was reading Numbers chapter 23. I came down to verse 21. Now here's the story of Balaam trying to curse Israel because Balak, the king of that area, wanted to have the people cursed and offered him a big reward if he'd go and curse them. Balaam thought about the money, thought I could do with it. God said, don't you go. Oh, do I want to go. Can't, can't I go? Can't I go? Eventually God said, you can go, but you can't curse them. Without going into all the details of the story, when they got there and he tried to curse, all he could do was bless. And Balak got angry. Said, you're blessing them. Now, this is not a good place for cursing. Let's go and try on that hill over there. So he went to a new location and tried again. And he opened his mouth to curse and blessings came out. And on one occasion, as he was uh, there, what did he say? Numbers chapter 23, verse 21. He, God, hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord of God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Here on the borders of the promised land, the children of Israel are about to enter Canaan, and God looks at them and he tells Balaam, I don't see any sin in them. How is that possible? Because the people had repented, that's why. God had forgiven. And as Ellen White said, now look on them as though they had never sinned in the first place. And yet what is the history of their wilderness wanderings for 40 years in the desert? Complaining about the water at Mara. Disobeying God a few days after hearing the Ten Commandments and made a golden calf and danced around and worshipped the idol. Many people died. Snakes were sent in to bite and kill many of the people because of their murmurings and complaining. Epidemics and pandemics, whatever, plagued them. And Korah, Dathan and Abiram on one occasion launched a rebellion. The earthquake came and opened up the earth and they swallowed them live down into the ground and closed over the top of them. They were gone. And the next day, after such a dramatic demonstration of God's displeasure, some of the survivors came to Moses and Aaron and said, you have killed the servants of God. And God sent a plague. Thousands more died. What a record. And yet on the borders of the promised land, God could say, I don't see any sin in my people. Now we're on the borders of the heavenly promised land. The church, expecting Jesus to return soon and God can look at the church when they are repentant and committed and say, I don't see any sin in my people. That is good news, the best news I can think of. 
You know, Jesus told the disciples to go the second mile. You know the story? Roman soldiers could compel a Jew to carry his bag, his knapsack or whatever, for one mile. Then you'd have to get somebody else to carry the second mile. Jesus said, well, if they force you to go one mile, go two miles. So God does that himself. Practice what he preached. Jesus said, you're guilty that I forgive you. But the second mile of the gospel is not now that you are a forgiven sinner, but that you are innocent. That's better than being a forgiven sinner to be classified as innocent in front of God because of what Jesus has done on the cross, how we should be thankful for what he has done. The Greek word to justify, dikaio, means to declare a person righteous, not to make a person righteous, but to declare that he is righteous. The pulpit commentary on Romans, page 137 of the pulpit commentary says, justification implies, neither implies that we are made ourselves just or that on the other hand, we are made just. As far as the word is concerned, it implies that we are reckoned in God's sight as being innocent. As far as the penalty of the law is concerned, the law has been fulfilled by the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And the penalty of the broken law can now no, no longer be inflicted on those who appropriate that righteousness as theirs. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. We are not justified by our obedience. Our obedience is the fruit of the fact that we have been declared righteous. Man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, Romans 3, verse 28. See, Luke tells us about the thief on the cross in chapter 23 of Luke. What chance did he have to do much in the way of good works? He was there hanging on the cross and going to die in the next few hours. He could not be justified by works of law only justified by the merits that Jesus had died a death for him and covered him with his righteousness. That's why we talk about righteousness by faith. When we believe in Jesus and believe that he died in our place, his righteousness counts for us. And that's why God can look at us and see not our sinful past, but look upon us as sinless because Jesus is sinless. We have Romans 4, 1 to 5, the example of Abraham and righteousness by faith. Faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness, chapter 4, verse 9. And again in verse Romans 5, 17, note that righteousness is a gift. This act of God in reckoning us to be just is called justification and is the work of a moment the moment you confess, you're forgiven and then counted as righteous in God's sight. Then begins the work of a lifetime, which is the process of growing more and more like Jesus in character as we live the Christian life. And this work is called sanctification. That is the work of a lifetime. As long as we live, we have to continue to, to grow more and more like Jesus. But all the time we can be covered with the righteousness of Jesus and be safe for eternity. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. It is God who can sanctify us. We don't sanctify ourselves. Justification is being accounted as righteous because we have accepted Jesus. Sanctification is being made more righteous through fellowship with Jesus. It's called the work of a lifetime. Well, in Acts of the Apostles, page 560, Ellen White says, notice this, so long as life shall last, we shall have self to subdue. Besetting sins to overcome, so long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point where we can reach and say, I have fully attained. Sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience. I remember... <laughs> I remember a story of a man at a prayer meeting stood up and not understanding the gospel 
walked up in front of the prayer meeting group and said, if you want to see a man who hasn't sinned for 20 years, look at me. And he walked up and down, back and forth in front of the people. Look at me. I haven't sinned for 20 years. And some sister in the back seat of the church who knew more about theology than he did said in a loud whisper, he's sinning right now. Claiming something that was not true. <laughs> Indulging pride. <laughs> and Yes. <clears throat> Sanctification is a long lifetime process. But if any man is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. But the old nature is there until glorification when Jesus comes. That's why Ellen White says, as long as life shall last, we've got this battle to fight with self. Some of you may have read the book, Harry Orchards, The Man That God Made Again. Harry Orchards was a man involved in the trade union movement back in America many years ago. And there was a conflict going on between trade unions and management. And, of course, politics was involved. And uh, some of the trade union men were not happy with the governor of the state of Idaho. So they hired Harry Orchards to put a bomb at his front gate. So when he opened the front gate of his place, going home one day, the bomb detonated and blew him up and killed him. Well, the police did their investigations and they tracked things down and I don't know what leads they got, but they, the leads led to Harry Orchards and they arrested him. And he was arraigned in court and tried. But while they were holding him in remand, waiting for the trial, the governor's widow, who happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist, sent a Bible down to the prison for him, to Harry Orchards. When the parcel was handed to him, Harry Orchards thought it contained a bomb. And they told him it came from the governor's widow. He thought she'd sent a bomb for him to open up and detonate himself as a revenge action. I said, well, if anyone's got a right to kill me, it would be the governor's wife because I killed her husband. He opened it and found it was a Bible. He'd never seen a Bible before, but he said, I, I think somewhere in the Bible it says that a murderer cannot go to heaven. I wonder where that verse is. And he started to read the Bible to find that verse. But he didn't find it because it's not there. Instead, he found verses that said all kinds of sins can be forgiven if we accept Jesus. And he found the gospel. And he was converted in prison before the trial. When the trial came, everybody was arranged, seated in prison, and then the judge came in last. Now the prisoner is supposed to be there before the judge comes in. <coughs> when the judge came in and looked over the ordinance, he couldn't see Harry Orchards. He'd seen him when he was arraigned and charged, but now he couldn't recognize him. So he didn't want to show his embarrassment, so he just said, prisoner, please stand. Harry Orchard stood up and the judge looked at him. He said, I couldn't recognize him. He looked like a different man. I'd seen the face of a hardened criminal a few months before, but now I see the face of a believing Christian. It looked totally different. Well, he was found guilty, put in prison. Became such a model prisoner that eventually he was sentenced to life. Eventually they trusted him in the state of the, with the prison, the town in the state of Idaho where the prison was located, small country town, that he, they built a little hut outside the prison wall, let him live there. Became a model prisoner, not a threat to anybody. He was free to go up the streets and buy some provisions as he needed them. The boys and girls playing on the street would say, hello, Harry, they knew him. And eventually he died, still a prisoner. You know, <clears throat> the book says Harry Orchard's The Man That God Made Again. I'm sure you'll find a copy in the Avondale Library if you'd like to read his story in detail. It's a well-known book. <clears throat> 
When a person is converted, it shows on their face. Abraham Lincoln once was uh, considering a man for a post in his cabinet <clears throat> and he was interviewing him, several of them and when one man came in, he looked at him and interviewed him and as he stepped out the room, he said to his aide, I don't like the look of that man. And the man said, but Mr. President, he can't help the way he looks. And Abraham Lincoln replied, every man over the age of 30 is responsible for the look on his face. He was a man that didn't have morals and it showed in his face and was rejected for the job. Years ago, they practiced slavery in the United States. And the story is told that one shipload of prisoners came in from Africa and uh, the cotton plantation owners and the wealthy landholders came down to look over the prisoners that were going to be auctioned to make a choice of who they'd bid for. And there was a big, strong African man with the muscles that just stood out on his body, a fine specimen of man that, oh, he'd be a good worker. He's a strong man. And several others thought the same. When the auction started, the bidding started to go up for this man. And he kept shouting at the men as they were bidding, I won't work! I won't work! Won't work! Won't work! They kept on bidding because they knew a whip would make him work. The way they got work out of an unwilling person was to give him a good whipping. Anyway, eventually one man pulled out of the bidding and the other man bought him. And when he went to pick him up, the man said to the man who had bought him, you wasted your money because I told you I won't work for you. The man said, that's all right. I didn't buy you to work for me. I'm a wealthy landowner. I have many men and women working on my plantation. But I don't believe in slavery and I pay them wages. I like the look of you, so I bought you to set you free. Oh, when the man realized what uh, he heard was true, what do you think he did? <clears throat> he fell down at that benefactor's feet and said, Oh, master, master, I will work for you till I die. That should be the attitude of all Christians. And they realize what Jesus has done for us. To fall at his feet and say, Lord, I will work for you till I die. Not because you can earn your freedom, but because Jesus has paid the price for our freedom. And our response is a loving response, as Jesus said in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Little children, I write unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, which is Jesus Christ the righteous. Now when a baby is learning to walk, often falls down. The parents have picked that child up and let them try again. It's like that in the early in the Christian life. We sometimes fall down and we have to be picked up and uh, carry on. And in conclusion, I'd like to tell a story about an atheist man who was attacking Christianity. He hired a hall, advertised his meeting, and many people came to hear his philosophy. After he gave his lecture attacking Christian faith and rubbishing the idea of salvation, Jesus and all, he opened up the meeting for some questions and had a microphone for the man to come and come up and ask a question so everybody can hear it, and then I'll give you my answers. One by one people came and one by one they were given their answers and a little old Christian man came up to the mic. And the man said, what's your question, sir? He said, uh, I've got something you want to do before I ask my question. He put his hand in his pocket, pulled out an orange, pulled out a pocket knife out of the other, opened up the blade, cut off the top of the orange, began to squeeze the juice into his mouth. The man said, what are you doing? Oh, he said, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask a question in a minute, but I'm just enjoying my orange first. He said, ask him what question, what is it? And everybody started to laugh because they thought this man, you know, was a little bit gone in the head. 
mental case. He said, oh, no, I've got a question, it's coming. Well, hurry up and answer, ask it. So eventually the man said, yes, well, okay, I'm ready for my question now. My question is a very simple one, sir. Tell me, is my orange sweet or is it sour? And everybody began to laugh. Yeah, typical man ready for mental hospital. He said, that's a stupid question. He said, that's my question, answer me. I can't answer your question. Why can't you answer my question? Because it's, I never tasted your orange, you silly fool. That's right, he said. You never tasted my orange, so you don't know whether it's sweet or sour. And you have never tasted Christianity, and you don't know whether it works or doesn't work. I have, and I know it works. And all the philosophy collapsed at the witness of a believer. And so my closing text is Psalm 34 and verse 8 which says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is every man that trusteth in him. And my invitation to all of you is to taste and see that the Lord is good, for he surely is, and he offers us a wonderful gift. May we all put out our hand and in faith accept it, is my prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we pray that you will grant that each one who hears the message of this talk today, will find in you the Saviour that they need. Make repentance of whatever sins they have committed. Receive forgiveness and receive the gift of eternal life that you have promised to those that so repent. So take us now to your care, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.